Uh, all right, what's up, everybody? Tim Gordon joins me. It's been a minute since he was on with us, but he's back. He's been making the rounds. He's been on a bunch of interesting, important shows and podcasts. So I want to catch up with Tim again. Tim, how are you doing? I'm well. How are you, Jay? I am doing great. We were just talking about uh, different calendars and being on the old calendar and the different uh, dates of Easter and whatnot. Uh, But I want to talk about the, um, first of all, you covered recently the issues with the push for the deaconess, uh, which, as we know, is a stepping stone to, well, doesn't it also follow that we should have female priests? Why not? So, uh, right. So we know this is a slippery slope. I thought you were really perceptive in calling that out and pointing out how a lot of the techniques that are used are kind of, they, they slide in something innocuous to prepare the way for the next stage that they really want to go down. Um, so I'd like for you to kind of get into your take on that. You had some really good videos talking about the deaconess and, and uh, both of us, you know, I had a, a, a deacon on as well, a non, a male deacon, <laughs> a real deacon on. And uh, we talked about this topic and he said the very same thing you said, uh, that the this is priming the pump for the introduction of something down the road. So I'd like to talk about that slow methodology of gradually bringing things in because not many people have, have figured this out. You figured it out and you nailed it. So Tell us about how that's going on in the Roman Catholic world, because the same thing is happening in the Orthodox world. Well, so I'll, I'll just start at the finish line and then and then work backwards. There's this Cardinal Gresh, one of the two guys. Gresh and Hollerish are the names of the two prelates who are running the synod on synodality for your non-Catholic audience. And they are essentially now admitting, as of two and two weeks ago, week and a half ago, that my theory was correct. I formulated my theory on September the 30th on my my channel. You can go watch it. it it's so exactly correct. Essentially, what they're going to do is um, an in-between lowercase d deacon class. The word in Greek just means helper. So my wife is my deacon, um, which Susanna and Joanna in, in Acts and, and other females are, of, of course, deacons, non-ordained. They're going to they're gonna reify make up out of whole cloth, a middle class of deacons between that and the obvious ordained deacon, part of the tripartite ordained class for for Catholics and Orthodox, you know, deacon, priest, bishop is is all part of the same ontological structure of ordination, Um, even though there's distinctions of degree and some real distinctions of kind there. Women have not ever been allowed to be ordained and according to a 1996 document, by JP2 or Nazio Sacerdotalis, they never can, and that's de fide or something very much like it. Well, so Gresh admitted two weeks ago that all of this funny business, this is the, the synodality business, has been oriented squarely at reifying a, a middle um, in between these two extremes, where wherein the, the principle of the excluded middle is supposed to control. There, there's nothing between. The lights are off in this room and the lights are on in this room. Women, women either can be ordained or not. My particular theory that I formulated on September the 30th on my channel was that they're going to do some middle way. It's a middle way. It's a deacon, but it's non-sacramental. But conceptually, it has to either shove up or shove down to either, well, just a helper, just a woman, <laughs> or or much, much, much more conceptually like an ordained deacon. And I I said that they would even, when they, um, in some parts of the world, they're already doing this. They lay the hand on the the male deacon's head, the real deacon's head. I was like, just taking a guess, the conceptual analogy to a footnote as used in a Morris Letizia or uh, an attachment to the document as in Carita Amazonia, the, the fudge factor will come in something like, I don't know. The bishop will be ordaining the new male deacon and his yeah. elbows will be resting on the wife. Now, speaking of like that, that fudge packing factor, this also relies to the <laughs> to the a pattern I'm noticing where there's a middle status now for the blessing of um, irregular unions. Uh, that seems to mirror the new middle status of a 
uh, 50% deaconess, right? Well, a deaconess isn't really a deacon. It's a 50% deacon. And uh, am I noticing a pattern here of introduction of new kind of middle, middle statuses there? You're absolutely right. I, um, what's it called? Fallacio supplicants or fiducia supplicants is the document <laughs> which the, the Catholic world erupted into debate. And this is very frustrating to me when Catholics will debate whether or not Francis has earned his bad reputation for such incrementalism, doing a, a very, very bad thing or set of things very slowly, and then gaslighting you if you say, this is what you're doing. He, he's earned it. And I, I argue with Catholics more than I argue with you uh, about this stuff, because it's, it's so clear that he's doing this. In the case of fiducia supplicants and um, simultaneous gay blessings for couples, um, it, it, it's important to know the context as late as spring of 2021, the outgoing doctrinal chief in the church had said, you can't do this. As always, it's it's a sacramental. It's not a sacrament. So a given um, Skittles man can, without confessing first, can go get a blessing. He can go get a blessing, you know, first in line, and then his paramour can get one right after him in line, but they cannot get them simultaneously because this, it would be a simultaneous blessing. It would be what everyone knows it is, some sort of formal cooperation with the sin of sod. And that was, I think that was March of 21. He said that. And then in the German world where revolution is always afoot, this guy, Heiner Wilmer, who, oh, I'll, I'll have to share a, a brief history on him in a second. Heiner Wilmer had at over 800 churches, simultaneous Skittles blessings. He, he did them like the very next month. The month after that, Pope Francis said, um, doctrinal chief, you're going to be on your way out. I'm, I'm done with you. I don't like, he, he didn't articulate what it was, but um, sources say it's that he didn't like the fact that this document in March of 2021, upholding the Catholic teachings against simultaneous gay blessings was upheld. Evidently, he'd given it to Francis to sign at the last minute. Francis' signature does appear on it, but Francis was mad. He fired him for it, and guess what? Um, at the end of 2022, when he was deliberating who will fill the doctrinal chief seat, that guy, Heiner Wilmer, the German revolutionary prelate, was twice, two different times, Francis's attempt for doctrinal chief. Evidently, someone talked reason to him. But the first thing that the incoming new doctrinal chief, whose name is Tucho Fernandez, did is he reversed the doctrinal teaching on whether or not there can be a simultaneous gay blessing. So yeah, it's, it's, it's incrementalism. As Catholic Julia Maloney has noted, Francis got his plan of attack of incrementalism from the, the famed Cardinal Martini, who was really supposed to be Francis I, but he got Parkinson's disease. You can read about this in Windswept House and, th and, and um, all kinds of novels and um, nonfiction, Catholic, yeah, uh, well, I got a question. So hold on. So is Cardinal <clears throat> is that supposed to be Paul the Six, or is that a different person? All of the book. I know the book uses coded terms for different people. Who who is that referring to in your view? Uh, Card Cardinal Carlo Martini was the leader of a little revolutionary outfit in the the nineties, much like the the cadre of cardinals discussed in Windswept House. They were they were doing that. Oh, okay. So I see. You're, so you're saying I see what you're saying now. Okay. Yeah. The generation later. Yeah, and Cardinal Martini was a real guy. He was the leader of the Sankt Gallen Mafia who who wanted to avoid a Ratzinger successorship to gotcha. the jump Paul II saying. papacy. Yeah, he was going to be Francis I, and, and he had all this stuff planned out, as, as a matter of fact, in 2014. Um, one of the, the good Catholic cardinals, one of the faithful ones, um, Walter Brandmuller, said, here's going to be Francis's plan. It's the Sankt Gallen plan, and it comes from Cardinal Martini first. Communion for divorce and civilly remarried, which check. Then um, women deacons, then something like um, the, the Skittles blessing, and then intercommunion with Lutherans. So we've known what to look for ever since 2014. Yeah. Um, another question I have, I got two questions on this point. One is, uh, I noticed a lot of the talk that was going on with Francis uh, some years back 
when he made the famous comments about uh, that civil unions should now be allowed. And that was kind of another uh, side angle where he could say, I'm just saying in the public uh, government sphere, we shouldn't uh, ban these kinds of unions. That was another uh, uh, s slow kill uh, way in, in, in as well, don't you think? Yeah, it was. it's part of the incrementalism too. Yeah. What, what, it's just doublespeak, you know, from the terms from the, um, the socialist, not socialist novels of the middle 20th century that you, you, you've, you've covered with our mutual friend, quite frankly, it's, it's called doublespeak. You just say something insinuating that your, your program is revolutionary. I'm going to make some major sweeping change. And then you say something that goes against that, um, you know, oh, Gender ideology is from the devil. Francis has said that a few times. And then you say some more, more meaningful things pushing the agenda. You just kind of push back against yourself. And yeah. all of your defenders, you know, who, who there are Orthodox Catholics who, who defend, I mean, small O. There are faithful Catholics who defend Francis. It's not just left cats. It's, it's people that are successfully successfully have been gas gaslit well they can they, they well hold on but they defend him uh charitably in, an, in a nuanced fashion so uh, <laughs> in they, a rapping fact yeah, yeah. exactly uh right well, i totally agree well. i think we had a, a dm conversation where we were talking yeah. about this this because every now and then i noticed this back when uh when i was uh, going to the latin mass back in the day and i would <clears throat> i would notice that you would see this tendency of there would be a a revolutionary statement or move by somebody high up uh, in, in the Vatican architecture, and then that would get a lot of press, a lot of pushback, and then they would they would move back a little, <clears throat> and then they might throw a bone uh, to the trads here and there. So, for example, you might have a a, a statement of a radical bishop saying or a radical cardinal somebody saying, "Oh, we need to bring in full on uh, Skittles marriage." Uh, that would get pushed back, and then they would say something like. Well, we got to preserve the traditional teaching, but we also might find a new place for these people in the ministry of the church or something like that. So there, it's, it's an Overton window where you take 20 steps forward and you move five steps back and you've accomplished your, your 15 steps. Is that, would you agree with that strategy? And it's not just the Roman Catholic world. This, this happens in the Orthodox world too, which is where I'm going to ask you the next question about, uh, about uh, some of the players behind the scenes that might be interested in pushing these agendas. Do you agree with that? Two steps forward. What's it's Paul Abdul, right? Two steps forward, one step back. When we yeah. get together, it's cause opposites attract. <laughs> right. Yeah, I was I was just gonna start singing that. So yeah, that, that's how much I agree. You be MC Scat Cat. I get to be Paul Abdul. You're MC Scat Cat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna send you a book. I'm not gonna name the book, but I'm gonna send you a book. Um, title by DM. I might even just send you the book. I have a couple extra that traces this out. You'll see how throughout the 90s, this was the plan. The Sankt Golan Mafia agenda said, I think you'd be shocked how much time in incrementalism has been mapped out as an algorithm. And they said, this is what works. This is how we get it. To oh, work. wow. It's, it's so this, there's a statement of them saying how strategize this incrementalism as well several statements oh, very wow. gratifying stuff it's just it's the way that um when you, you work within you operate within the confines of a magisterial faith where um things can become crystallized if e day you just say well if we want female deacons i mean this is how i figured it out if we want female deacons in a post ordinatio sacerdotalis world post-1996, where it's de fide, that there can't be female deacons, we'll just make them and we'll say they're non-sacramental, but then they'll do all the sacramental stuff ergonomically that uh, a real sacramental deacon would do, and we'll gaslight anybody that pushes back, and yet there will essentially be sacramental deaconesses. And, and you know, this is they, they haven't worked out too much. Well, it's really not that hard. That's how you have to operate in a magisterial faith. Yeah, for those uh, in the chat that are uh, wondering, uh, I'll put Tim's video here where he uh, dealt with this in more detail uh, right here. The I told you so video where he goes into discussing <clears throat> um, his call uh, a while back on this point. Now, my next question relates to 
uh, and I'm trying to, not to freeze frame it where your face is making uh, weird contortions. So I'm trying to find like a normal, uh, let's see if we can, we can get you a sort of looking up into the sky. Maybe there you go. We'll see you. So you're now you're looking up at me uh, in this video. So the way it is on the screen, I'm just trying to freeze it to where, <laughs> to where it doesn't look like you're doing something weird. So now you're looking at me, uh, uh, and I'm I'm teaching you. You're down. So that that's appropriate, right? So now you're 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 listening to your hey. betters. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> next next question is. In the Orthodox world, the way this works is that we have certain centers that are pushing for the exact same thing with the exact same strategy. And one of these is, of course, the St. Fotini Center, I think they call it. Uh, this gets a lot of money, we know, from certain what are called archons. Archons are these uh, very wealthy uh, laity that are sort of just given the title archon from the ecumenical patriarchate. They're, uh, they're very uh, uh, close to elements of the U.S. government. Uh, in the U.S., so this is partly why a lot of the Greek Orthodox in America are very, not all of them, many of them are, are solid on these issues, but many of them are kind of pushing for these odd things, and it's because of this money, and there's they have a, a big leg into the academia, uh, into academia, so there's an academic uh, element, there's this center uh, that's pushing for it, and then you've got these wealthy people pushing for it through foundations and kind of uh, NGOs and this kind of stuff. Uh, is there an element of this in the Roman Catholic world where there's maybe NGOs or, or wealthy people in the background uh, that you know of? Or is this more like a full on like World Economic Forum close to Francis type of thing? Or where do you think the the is it is it a top down from the St. Gallen Mafia or, or are they being told like, hey, there's power players that want to see changes in the Roman Catholic world from your vantage point. Well, all of the dicasteries have been replaced by personnel by Francis. Uh, literally all, I think it's nine, is it nine or 11 dicasteries? Some are much less important than others have been replaced. The, uh, for, the, for the ortho Orthodox audience, what, what does that mean? The dicasteries are the, you know, like people, people know the Holy office is the topmost of the nine or 11 dicasteries right. that, that help that are the Vatican. They, they constitute the, the arm of the Vatican that tends to particular things like congressional subcommittees to make a sort of crass metaphor. And, um, the Holy office is the congregation for the doctrine of the faith now called the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith. And Francis replaced all, each of those has a prefect, the prefect of the, dicastery for the doctrine of the faith is the number two in the church, you know, the, the head of the holy office. And of course, all of those dicasteries have been staffed with new world order types by, by Francis that are, you know, you know, like Gresh and Hollerish, the two guys I was talking about that are running the synod on synodality that are now basically admitting what they're doing. That's essentially what they have everything. So there's the Pontifical Academy for Life, the PAV, um, cause it's Vita. Um, uh, instead of life that also has been traditionally a pontifical academy for pro-life issues as the name suggests and it's now essentially the pontifical academy for working on the chipping away at the sex issues and even inviting pro-abortionists to come talk so together with the close association that francis has with Folks like Bon Ki Moon, Jeffrey Sachs, yes, Wef. Uh, it, it's very easy in our superstructure when you don't have Leo the Thirteenth or Pius the Tenth, or at the very least Benedict Sixteen. Very, very least. Um, the the dicastery structure has just been ran through, and it's essentially now very operatively close to. Um, the one world or is in the new world. Do you order? think that this is, uh, we hear this term kind of uh, bantied around the deep church. Would that be these decast, the, the decastery uh, individuals, or is that something else even more secret than that? Yeah. Vigano, um, Archbishop Vigano coined that term. And I, I think it's apropos. I think it's fair. Yeah. Um, one last question on that topic is, uh, you mentioned the German bishops. Uh, I remember back when I was going to Latin Mass, we would hear oftentimes about some of the most radical bishops always kind of being German bishops, German uh, uh, individuals, and also maybe some of the Danish. I think I think they introduced like 
uh, new catechisms that had Skittle stuff in it a long time ago. Um, why do you think that those areas tend to be to be so radical? My suspicion would be that um, if you get deep into the, this is just my opinion, uh, you, you may have a totally different take. If you get deep into the um, history of the post-World War II era of Germany, uh, the U.S. and its deep state structure they went heavily into re-education. We actually had re-education camps for Germans to teach them to be uh, good Americans in Germany and to not believe in anything like, quote, authority in order to prevent, you know, another supposed uh, tiny mustache man. So there was a lot of, um, of that going on, and that allowed the CIA to really set up a, re a really strong power base uh, throughout Germany to really condition the future generations of Germany to, to be, um, uh, Americanist in many, many ways. And I mean that in the worst sense of the term Americanist, uh, yeah. and to not fall prey to believing in institutions of quote authority, monarchy, uh, uh, tiny mustache man, church, having authority, bishops, card, all that kind of stuff. So my suspicion is that, do you think maybe there's that, that might be an element of this? Anytime I hear German stuff, that's my first thought. Uh, or do you have another take as to the, why? Why is it that arena where this seems to be such a, a haven of these sort of weird, weird libs? It's a good question. I mean, they they love like discotheque dance music. Just kind of just kind of a weird culture in general. And, and what you're recounting is not inconsistent at all. Very concomitant with what I've found when I looked into the the 20th century weird uh, German um, German American culture. But we also say, if we stretch a little further back in the Catholic Church, that through the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, the Reformation never left Germany or, or Northern Europe, simplicitaire. Like you, you're, you're smart to note Austria, Hungary, even though Hungary pushes back some uh, politically, um, you know, Belgium is it has one of the worst. Got Gottfried Daniels. Is Daniels, that's what I was trying to think of, Daniels, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he's the one that that um, Pope Francis, I didn't know who he was at the time when I was very unhappy back in 2013 that this South American Jesuit had become Pope. Uh, he brought out Gottfried Daniels on the loggia with him, and it, it was just a creepy, creepy moment. But Daniels is actually the guy who admitted in his autobiography that there was something called a Sankt Gallen Mafia. He called it Mafia Club. You can go get this interview online where he says, yeah, we would just meet once a year, which is not true. They met more often than, off, than that, this Sankt Gallen Mafia. And it was basically all about, we met from, from 95 to 2004, once a year, uh, and talked about how to avoid a presumptive Ratzinger papacy because everyone knew Ratzinger, who was JP2's doctrinal chief, was going to be Pope. How to avoid that because it was so conservative we wanted to remake the church and um in in, in there's other things that daniels is infamous for but he represents a like you say a broader ideological moment in the, the northern europe where we just say the reformation's never left there and then you you look at the weirdness of world war one world war two um uh what's his name uh, you, you and I always talk about the video, Myron, uh, what's his name? Oh, Myron Fagan. Fagan, Fagan. And it, you take that stuff into account and that gives a good explanation for the amping up and the particularizing of that sentiment in that region um, in between the world wars and especially after World War II. So I, I think I think everything you said. Yeah, uh, the, yeah, I did a talk a couple of nights ago about Christ the King and we were getting into the history of this, the idea of the social teaching of, uh, both Orthodox and Catholic Church both agree that there is a duty that the state has to God. It's not autonomous. It can't be doing whatever it wants. Uh, that lends to, to statism. And uh, one of the things that I found interesting was that a lot of people overlook the fact that the Re Reformation um, couldn't have happened without the German princes, for example, supporting Luther. So a lot of the Reformation had a statist move, a state background uh, think of Henry VIII as well. He became head of the church uh, in his domain, so it's another statist move. Um, so I, again, I wonder if there isn't just a, a long-standing st <clears throat> animosity in a lot of the European countries uh, going back to these, you know, power struggles between uh, church and state is a big part of it. I'm not saying that's everything. Obviously, there's other issues too, the things that uh, Luther raises and so forth. So, um, any comments on that? Because, because the reason I say that is that. 
I don't think there's a whole lot of difference between that and now. It's just that now I think probably the, the, the compromising that goes on of high-level people in entertainment, in the state, and in the church. Great book I recommend everybody read is Whitney Webb's book, uh, One Nation Under Blackmail, particularly Volume 2, which is about Jeff Stein McEffrey, because you'll notice the patterns of compromise through the things that we're talking about today, uh, like Skittles type stuff. Perhaps these prominent clerics uh, might be compromised by Skittles things, which then make them operatives to do the things that they're doing. I mean, they might also not be compromised and literally just believe <laughs> like, like that they want the change. So, but it can be both as well. Would you, would you agree with that? Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah agree. Um, I mean, a lot of people forget by the way that, you're mentioning the importance of the German princes in the Reformation after, you know, between 1570 and 1519, Luther switched his position on that peasants upro uh, uh, uprising. Yeah, he was like, Literally. kill him. <laughs> yeah, he was like, kill him. He was going back and forth, 120,000 dead. It was largely a land thing. The German princes tied it to his, his wacky new theology. And his wacky new theology was changing from 1517 to 18 yes. to 19 to 20. Um, it wasn't, wasn't really, he wasn't really trying to form a new church until the German princes were like, hey, if you form a, a brand new Christian thing, a, a, a Christian moment, you know, where you don't have to have bishops and sacraments, then um, we'll support you at, at uh, Wartburg Castle. You yeah, know, he, was, he was hiding as Junker George. Uh, in the castle where he had a big beard and he was uh, under, uh, he, he had a, he was acting like a, he had a handler. Right? So, I mean, I'm not literally saying Luther was a spy, but he was famously Junker yeah. George uh, hiding out in that castle wearing a big beard. That's, that's hilarious. That's, it's, it's like Mission Impossible level here, stuff. Yeah. I, so when I was a yeah. Protestant, I was never a Lutheran, but um, um, I was a Calvinist, but I, I really got into Luther for a period where I read a bunch on his life. I read, uh, I think, five of his commentaries and books. So I really wanted to get immersed in Lutheranism and just to understand it from a, from a Reformation perspective. And one thing I thought was fascinating is that the point that you just made, people, people kind of think that there was this sort of... Uh, this holistic thing called Lutheranism. No, no, no. This was an evolving, contradicting thing over a long span of time. You're right, right. And remember, I mean, you know, from Cal um, Calvin set up basically a little work camp. Sort there. of theocracy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's always true. Yeah, the, the crisis king thing is real. And um, I think it's hilarious. I think it's quite a white pill that this is burst onto american popular discourse like can, can you say christ is king isn't saying anything positive about jesus really uh um anti you know s um i think this is a great great sort of breakthrough for america yeah we can transition over to the next topic which is the uh, recent controversy of um can we say christ the king is it uh, anti uh, uh, Shem Wow ish. <laughs> I'm always I'm trying to come up with uh, creative code words, as you guys know. So, uh, yeah, can we be pro Shem? By the way, I, I've, I've always not liked that term because everybody knows Arabs are also descendants of Shem. Uh, I mean, if you believe the Bible, then Shem is the you know forefather of both uh, the Hagarenes uh, and the Jews, uh, the Hebrews. So, isn't pretty much everybody who isn't like a Eastern European uh, import, aren't they all uh, Sham Wowish people? <laughs> anyway, um, so I don't want to get too hefty on the YouTube sphere, but uh, you did another video. Let's move on to that one where you, and I'm not trying to cause drama or anything. I know that uh, you, and, you and Trent are buds, but you did uh, give some pushback on the issue of can we say Christ is King because this popped up. This popped off all over Twitter the other day. Uh, first, because, of course, Candace uh, Owen being let go, fired, whatever happened uh, from Daily Wire. Uh, we know that, that, that this this is, a, is sort of a hot-button topic at Daily Wire because of it being very much a Con Inc. Uh, institution. Um, you know, there's certain domains that you can go into. I, by the way, just side note here, it's not just... Christ is King and the role of Jesus issues that are hot button at Daily Wire. I also think they were, I can't prove this, but I've a long time speculated that 
you can't talk about anything deemed quote conspiracy. So I think anything yeah. you know, um, Al Jones sphere would be uh, haram <laughs> at Daily Wire. So anyway, I'm sorry for rambling here. I'm, I'm just my my mouth is just rambling. But um, why did you uh, take issue with the so first the phrase? Can we use it at all? I thought when they made that space, by the way, that it was going to be like a discussion about whether or not there is a social teaching of Christianity for the state, which that wasn't actually what the whole debacle was about. I was hoping to interject some of that issue because I hear all these Protestants saying this and I'm like, what, how does a Protestant believe Christ is king? I don't understand that because, I mean, unless you're a full-on Erastian, like Protestantism doesn't typically have a teaching yeah. for the, the, the state. They're usually, because they're like 90% evangelical, I think, nowadays, in the in America, at right. least, like they are anti. Roger Williams said the state's the devil, basically, right? Right. Yeah, it's, it was it was weird. I mean, did, did you happen to catch that Twitter space, tw spaces, whatever it is? Uh, I spaces? heard about maybe forty minutes of it, and then I checked out. So I didn't actually hear the part when uh, certain uh, unnameables came in, <laughs> like Fuego? like Nicholas Nicholas, Nicholas uh, yeah. Yeah, that that part was good. I and I only heard about two thirds of it. I, I was felt like I was hearing pop culture history being made when um, Fuego and and Jeremy Boring were talking. I, yeah, that I was believe. very interesting. I, I was surprised to hear Nicholas Fuego. Oh, that's funny. And uh, Jeremy, that I mean, I I heard the later. I didn't hear it when it happened, but I heard the later clip of them. Uh, uh, so I, I don't know what to make of that. My suspicion is that I mean, I'm not trying to be a, do, a d bag, but. I don't think he really means it. I think a lot of the people over there will say things for public, for what's uh, useful at the time. I will be surprised if there's ever an actual discussion there. With between um, Shapiro and and said said or, no man. any of them uh, any of them. like uh, yeah Fuego in Daily Wire at all I would be surprised if that actually happens. Well, I, I look my experiences with with Michael J Knowles are, are you know he's he's a friend and I, very very thoroughgoingly sincere person no i'm not so, i'm not knocking michael i'm just saying like yeah. the the sort of ethos of the the it is. high it is. no 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 that's that's i mean that's what everyone thinks and everyone has their own experiences which con verify that with um and so it's just, i just always you, you weren't saying that at all i'm just saying there are some really really i think fantastic people associated with i think i think Knowles is phenomenally talented in terms of being likable and introduced he's introduced a lot of the um my case for patriarchy arguments against feminism in such a likable way and he, he was one of the early supporters of the book and he, he's also a very likable catholic on the top scene but but the the outfit is is getting more and more and more problematic fuego was supposed to come on that's what my i'm getting channel. at yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just getting it's just getting more and more anathema to anybody left, right, center under fifty years old. The only folks that uh, on on the right anyway that support that kind of foreign policy and the sorts of um, I don't know presuppositions, the, theological presuppositions that that go along with it are people that are over 50 and and so i i've i've, I've told higher ups at uh dw you have a real demographic problem people under 50 left right center do not identify with this nowhere along yeah, the it's, right it's like do they want to be like the latest version of fox news basically right right and it's the dispensationalism the um the zeocon vibe in general is just not and not all of them have it. I mean, like the two Catholics there. I, I don't know Walsh at all. I think I've had one brief text conversation, but he's not for it. Uh, you know the, the the adventurism over there, for lack of a better word. I don't think Knowles is, but that you correctly intuited. I don't think. I think everyone now knows that you're not really allowed to to say much beyond. Well, I don't like adventurism. That you're not allowed to say specifically the worst kind of adventurism we can engage in if we're America first is um, zeoconism. I mean, I'm trying to codify all this. In it. No, I understand. And the, for those that are wondering what we're talking about, if you saw my fourth hour yesterday on uh, Lord Voldemort, um, I spent most of the time critiquing dispensationalism and evangelical 
psyopism. <laughs> Cre creative terminology. This is hard. Yeah, all right. Uh, uh, I do like sham wowism though. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, look, this, and I went into the history of like how you know even even dispensationalism actually in the the Schofield study about, but it actually has a history that a lot of people don't know about that connects it to the geopolitical power structure. In fact, that was promoted in America via Oxford University and certain families that had a vested interest, like we'll say the Ralph, uh, Ralph style family. <laughs> they had a vested interest in getting Americans into the idea of the Schofield Study Bible prior to the 1917 Balfour Declaration, the establishment of uh, the nation state of uh, uh, Israel. So that's, there's a, even a geopolitical element to the Schofield Study Bible, which popularized uh, pre-tribulation rapture and all this nonsense in America. And that's why mm -hmm. people like John Hagee have such a, a, an ability to, you know, capture the mind of the evangelical boomer is precisely because mm -hmm. of this years of priming through this ridiculous uh, heretical study Bible. But yeah, I mean, I know you know that, Tim, so we're speaking to the choir on that topic. But um, yeah, so, there, so we had this uh, a sort of, debacle with uh, can we say this term it's odd that the, obviously the term itself isn't anti-semitic i don't know so it's like another situation where uh oh well if you say the term but it might hurt somebody's feelings well seems like ben shapiro has said a lot of things where he wasn't very concerned with hurting anyone's feelings so i don't understand why you know if we're gonna have free we either have free speech uh obviously within limitations of legality or we don't right well it's like Snowball or Napoleon says, I forget who it is in Animal Farm. All, all pigs are equal pigs, but some pigs are more equal than others when it comes to feelings. I don't know if you know, I don't know if you ever watch or habitually watch, I'm sure you've watched it, The Passion of the Christ. You know, Matthew chapter 27, verse 25. Yeah, I've seen it. That's, that's all I'm going to say. That That is, um, that was a big compromise. That is in the film, in aramaic or whatever yeah i remember but, that scene and when the movie came out i went to see it i was a trad cat at the time and uh it was it was all over the news controversial that that was that they didn't cut that but they cut the subtitle they cut the subtitle out so you oh, can't read it in Houston. so you see i mean so when you say i'm not sure whether this is anti chem anti like finkelstein or whatever i'm not sure it's not i mean it depends how we define this term and it's almost a capital offense to even define the term anti-s maybe it is i mean maybe just the new testament is it is what i the direction i've been thinking this isn't my but big again issue. i mean it's like so what, what it actually ends up having to mean is uh strictly rabbinical judaism so anything anti is strictly r reduced to rabbinical judaism and it's like i mean again aren't many arab peoples uh sons of shem i mean that's what i'm trying to say right yeah i agree but but when it comes to well, crisis king because jeremy boring made this big distinction you could tell he thought it was really really clever well there's there's anti rabbinic judaism so you 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 open the door i'll, I'll shut it anti-rabbinic judaism connotatively and anti-rabbinic judaism denotatively and you know of course then crisis king could not be anti um denotatively because it just means jesus is king and of course i affirm this but connotatively this is like saying something about cornbread to you know basketball americans if, if you say it to be mean like go eat some cornbread then that could be connotatively rude and i my i did a tweet responding to him and i was like but in this particular context that connotation would be contextualized um there's a collapse between connotation and denotation because you're we're only why people will say is it only anti s to say christ is king it it affirms the the truism uh, the real truism of christ's social kingship over all of the false religions so why is only one complaining about it well to be fair and of course i i love the expression i say it all the time there's only one religion that this really is a specific historical announcement of triumphalism uh, there against. 
And so I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's anti-S, so don't say it. Maybe I'm saying something more like it is, and go ahead and say it, you know, uh, kind of, kind of like Matthew 27, 25. It, it, how does that resonate with you? I mean, Candace Owens seems to agree. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Like the point I'm getting at is that even on their grounds, people like Ben Shapiro, Shapiro argues all the time for free speech. And then he, he makes all kinds of Jesus jokes. Uh, you know, I think I'm trying to remember who it was. somebody, it was either Fuego or you, somebody was pointing out old tweets from eight or 10 years ago that are still up. I don't know if you've seen this. Oh, I, I pointed that out. Was that I, you? I, I okay. Heard, that was you. Yeah. yeah I've never so, heard that fucking joke. You know, like I'd literally never heard that one. I'd heard, I'd heard a couple of the other really, really anti-christic, um, Jokes are just comments. I don't even want to say it on for, for me, you know, for Catholics, it's Holy Saturday and some Orthodox, but like common street criminal. Oh, yeah, totally un, uninteresting. Just just a common street criminal. I'd heard that and I'd heard a couple other ones. I had never heard the hands up, don't nail joke. And so I went to look it up and just see if I could find a screenshot. That fucking thing is still up. It's still up right now. Right, and I was right. like, why and how is this still up and how? This is like the worst one. This is this is making a joke about deicide. And um, yeah, okay. Okay, facts don't care about our feelings. We can make jokes. But then why the sensitivity? Why cry out as you strike me? You know, I, I just, exactly. I did not know about this. Yeah, yeah. that's the thing is that there's, there's this is sort of a constant double standard. And it's like, you know, the way I view it is, you know, as Christians, we know that we're going to get hate. We're going to get called names. We're going to get... Uh, people saying all kinds of blasphemous stuff. If you're somebody who, for example, does debates a lot, uh, myself, I, I've, I've heard of thousands of times, you know, Muslims, even Jews, other people saying uh, all kinds of stuff to us as Christians or blaspheming what we believe. It doesn't bother me. Like, I've heard it a million times. It, it's not, you know what I mean? So this weird, like, hypersensitivity when, it's, when, it, when this is said... Right. It's, a, it's just a total double standard. And to me, it suggests weakness of the position is what I'm trying to say, because okay. uh, I, I'm confident in my positions. I'm, I can always be corrected on something. But overall, the basics, I'm confident in the positions. So when I hear people mocking or whatever, like it doesn't I don't get all freaked out like, oh, my gosh, somebody said they don't believe what I believe. And they made fun of my deity. Uh, like I'm not worried about it. Right. So but people that do get overly sensitive to me suggests are they maybe not that confident in their position? It's it's an emotional reaction. It's a, it's a kind of a weakness is what I'm trying to say. So yeah, to me, a lot of this suggests a lot of weakness. Um, so anyway, um, I agree with, with now you, you asked about um, Trent, Trent Horn, who was part of some sort of platoon of Christians that were saying some, iteration or another of Jeremy Boring's point. Like, oh, of course you can say Christ is King denotatively, but con they were all kind of on this bandwagon, but connotatively it can become really, really wrong to say because um, Trent went into the specific ground of expulsions from either polities or institutions. And he's, he literally said in his response video, it was very, very frustrating for me to watch. He literally said he equated uh, expulsions of Christians from particular, I, I think he's referring mainly to Northern Europe when it was just, you know, Protestant revolters who were expelling us and, and, and Christians had been mistreated or, or forced out because they were subversive to an anti-Christic culture, to a, to a non-sacramental culture, or even in some cases, a, a secular humanist culture. Well, yeah, we're subversive in that sense. And he said, well, this is literally just as wrong as the famed 109 expulsions from either polities or even just institutions. He said even, even American institutions like the, the State Department was insinuated. If you want that, then this is just as wrong if you're a Catholic or a Christian. Uh, it's just as wrong as other people doing this to us. And I was like, wait a minute. These 109, that's, that's utter cultural relativism warned against by Benedict XVI in the third section on the Regensburg Address. All cultures aren't the same. Like 109 expulsions have happened. Not, not all of them, maybe some of them were erroneous, but most of them 
I haven't looked at all 109. Most of them were because there was subversion, very intentional, very clever, very nuanced subversion of Catholic culture happening, of Christian culture happening. And I'm like, to say that to be called a subversive here and expelled against Christian culture and to be called a subversive here against at least non-Catholic culture in medieval Europe, second millennia Europe, to say those are equally wrong just misses the point. And it is actual cultural relativism simplicitaire. We have to talk about there being a final truth and a final good. And some cultures are more squarely oriented at it. And subversives of those good cultures are are bad guys. Well, doesn't every doesn't every Catholic, uh, and I would agree with the Catholic position on this, affirm the uh, this principle when, for example, the Christianization of um, you know like Mexico and places like that, or or when when Spain would go and and set up a Christian colony, they certainly didn't have in mind the idea that all the cultures were basically the same. No, I'm pretty sure Catholic culture is, uh, in this sense, the even Spanish Catholic culture of is- Isabella. And, I mean, that's superior to Aztec, Incan, Mayan human sacrifice. I'm sorry, it's just, it is, it's superior. So the idea that as a Catholic, you would have this uh, cultural relativist principle is odd to me, given the fact that every Catholic I've ever heard defends this principle when, uh, you know, basically human sacrifice is put to an end in uh, in Mexico and other areas. Well, they do, <laughs> I mean, except in this singular area, this area of this widespread sweeping cultural solacism of the anti-S stuff. It, everyone knows. I mean, I think we're about the same age. We knew you could say whatever you want. As an 18-year-old, if you say, oh, like, Arabs live in their own filth, which um, Shapiro said. You know, Boring brought this up in the spaces. Oh, he was 18. But it, literally 20 minutes before that, he was trying to level against Fuego. Fuego. That he had made some jokes when he was 18 uh, against a different class of Semitics. And one's forgivable, one's not. Everyone knows it. It's it's in the air. You know, it's like every, every, every human mind is a barometer for, for mimetic desire. And everyone knows you're in trouble if you make fun of the wrong kind of Semitic. And um, that's all it seemed to be. I don't, I don't think, I don't even think Trent realized he was doing it. I think it's just that inbuilt barometer, like, oh, I don't want to get in trouble. So reifying pseudo principles based on that inbuilt barometer and not even realizing. I, 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 Trent Horn, have written a book on why, I think he has, on why the Crusades are good. I, the Inquisition was good too. And defensible. Too. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I, I remember he has a book on that. I think. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, that, that, that's what partly why I was kind of trying to bring that up with, you know, the the way that imperial cultures would do missionary work, particularly like Spain and, and nations like that. Now, uh, it, it, this is not a trap. I'm not trying to you know cause a debate or whatever because I know that well, we're coming up on an hour here in a little bit, and usually you do uh, hour interviews. I don't want to keep you too long, but. Um, by the way, guys, in the chat, if you want to support the show, you can do so via the Super Chat function. You can leave a Super Chat through Streamlabs, right? Uh, well, that's not it. But uh, in the show description, there is the Streamlabs link. Um, now, this is a little bit more of a, of a trickier topic uh, because it's a little bit more of a, like I guess say, a theological issue. And I'm just want, I just want your take. I'm not trying to get you to, to be trapped or it's not, it's not a debate point, but... Um, I take issue with this idea of there being an, an Abrahamic faith. Um, I don't think, in my view, that it makes sense. I mean, it's really ambiguous. What do we mean by that? Uh, so, you know, I don't believe there's a lowest common denominator, you know, set of like, oh, well, these three, these five attributes are the ones that we share with the Muslims. So therefore, we have the same uh, deity. The deeper that I've gotten into, for example, studying Islam in the last five years through all these these Muslim debates, to me, the more I study Islam, the more I see how it's it's not at all uh, uh, similar to our faith. It's kind of like a weird mix, in my view, of like Nestorianism, Arianism, uh, paganism, Talmudic tradition, pseudepigrapha, elements of uh, uh, existing uh, Arab uh, pagan culture, all kind of blended into to one thing. It's, it's a very bizarre thing. So I'm just curious, because uh, Trent and I had a, a pretty feisty back and forth the other day about 
whether or not there is a Abrahamic faith. And I just want to get your take on it. It's not a trap. I'm not going to try to debate you. Just get your position, what you think about that. Because this plays into the issue with the ShamWow that we've been talking about, right? Of course. <laughs> I mean, do... I mean, like, I was, I was thinking about this because of the Triduum. And um, I was watching e Easter movies with my kids. And it's, it, it's biblical that, that um, Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, was freaked out when he, he um, found out of, that, that Mary was with child. And yet he had a dream that he describes as being from the Holy Spirit uh, that, that assured him, you know, this is the chosen one of God. And of course, we, we have the, the three visitors of Abram, and they, they say, you know, I, I am. That's, that's really cool typology. I, I get excited about that typologically as, as a non-theologian. You know, I just always tell people I'm an Aristotelian philosopher. That's exciting to me typologically, but this doesn't alter my expectations for either of the other two Abrahamic faiths, um, such as to, to, to make me believe in any kind of Trinitarianism on their part. I mean, like the, the ones like, if, if this is what you're asking, Joseph, stepfather of Jesus, who acknowledges there's the Holy Spirit, and, and of course, Jesus is the second person of the same trinity well those ones all became christian so i i was a bit surprised by the trans transposition of you know striking as a distinction of degree striking similitude the assertion of of strong similitude to um you know islam or judaism on specific on like trinitarianism is this where you're going with it well the specific issue of the uh, debate that we had it goes back to the debate that he and i had a couple of years ago about uh natural theology and the specific proposition of well the debate was about whether uh there is natural theology and and that was defined as a la fides et ratio of john paul ii philosophy mm -hmm. philosophizing about god apart from divine revelation However, what our debate our discussion the other day was about evolved into the question of the Old Testament believers, because in the debate, originally, Trent made the point that, well, we didn't have Trinity in the Old Testament. The assumption is that there was a sort of generic Unitarianism that we believed in, uh, or that they, excuse me, the Old Testament saints believed in. And then we had the revelation of uh, Christ as divine and the Trinity in the New Testament. And it's a specific key point of departure for Orthodox apologetics, for example, against Muslims, that we always stress that no, the Old Testament teaches the triad. It doesn't teach it in the way that Nicaea does. It teaches Yahweh, his angel messenger, and his Holy Spirit. And of course, in a lot of the Muslim debates, I've had to you know really stress this. If you watch a lot of, for example, Sam Shamoon's debates with Muslims, he makes this same point all the time. It's a, it's a key point for Christians to refute Muslims and Jews is to point out that we're not teaching anything new. The explication of the doctrine in terms of the theology of Nicaea and so forth, that explication, that precision is new. But the idea that Abraham, for example, worshipped a generic unity, and then by the time of Jesus and the apostles, it's now a trinity, I believe that's false. So that's where the debate eventually got to. But it, it, the only reason I'm saying all this is that if it might relate to the point earlier about the cultural issues with uh, Trent's blind spot here because Trent has to make uh, what I see as a common case for Muslims, Jews, and Christians all worshiping the same God. But if they don't, if Abraham worshiped the triad implicitly, then it's it's two different two different situations here. There isn't, and my, my point is just simply this, that I don't think there's a common uh, Abrahamic faith. Yeah, I, look, I mean, it... Ed Fazer um, deals with this really satisfyingly in terms of, uh, what is it, Dignitatis Humanae, one of the Vatican II documents, or is it... Uh, it's Nostra Aetate. It's Nostra Aetate with Judaism. There's a couple that mention it. There's Dignitatis Nostra, and actually even Lumen Gentium has a line or two. And um, there's the difference, philosophically, where, where I'm comfortable, between sense and reference. So um, when you say, look, we're... we're if you're talking to your blind, semi-blind buddy and you're looking off in the sky and you say, like, I see a cloud that looks like a, you know, anvil or something like that. And they're like, well, I just see a cloud, but it looks like a 
I don't know, a big piece of cheese. You're you're referring to the same yeah, object right. that in, enjoys an ontological status that that is fixed. Um, but sense, you know, what 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 is being made of it by you know what's being made of it subjectively, the the sense of the thing, right? Can can differ widely, and so I don't. I mean, I don't know if this is a Catholic Orthodox point of departure. I, I haven't looked into it much. Yeah, I think you I'm, could get, I grant you that point. And I think uh, when I did the stream the other day, uh, re responding to Trent, I grant that that point that if it was restricted to that sense, you could get around it. However, uh, to me, it looks like in Nostra Aetate, it specifically extends the worship of God. So it's not just the sort of intentional recognition, but actually it seems to suggest worship and communion. And that to me is where it, it crosses the line to where I don't see that as a, as a way to get out of it. Now, again, not trying to debate you. I'll let you have the last word on this, uh, however you want to respond. Well, I was writing, I was beginning research and to write a book defending the Vatican II documents, which I, I always say, look, they're not, they're not as problematic as the Pontificate of Francis. But I agree with um, classical theist on this point that Nostre, which is not one of the four constitutions, it's one of the declaratias of Vatican II, is more problematic than the air. Where is it? I, I forget what other document. It's one of the constitutions where it actually reads um Muslims worship the one the the one right. god even even Pius X in his personal catechism said he used the term they worship the one true god but this can be parsed by sense and reference and it's it's not a problem obviously Pius X you know Jay is considered very very based among the the recent popes by by Catholics like myself um but when Nostre and the the almost count uh, about face on the teaching of the Jews together with um, John the 23rd. One of the first things he did came in in, the, in 1959 on the Good Friday liturgy, uh, removed the word perfidious about the, you know, um, Finkelsteins. Yeah, I remember this, that as a tread cat, yeah. This is harder to get around by just or, um, reference to sense reference. This is harder to get around than right. um, saying, oh, well, this is bad, you know. Uh, another part mentions the kind of you it's the use mentioned distinction like buddhists think that they can get into nirvana by their <laughs> yeah method. and it mentions Doesn't the same similar for hindus can. hindus as well yeah hindus as well yeah so that's all you can set that aside and it's not so problematic i'm not saying i know i'm no theologian but no stray and and the specific relation to the you know elder brothers in the faith um that seems one step closer to one step closer to problematic and i didn't want to i thought I, I could get around all these other things by philosophical parsage but i'm like this is kind of kind of above my pay grade insofar as i'm not a theologian nostra is i think um i think the the most close to problematic of all those vatican ii documents thank, thank goodness i would agree with that i mean I, I remember you know i've read the vatican ii documents over the years all of them i think um and that one has always stuck out as kind of the, the most difficult um especially given all of the you know strong statements of the vatican the roman sea uh, against the position of judaism i mean if you go back to like uh cantate domino and if you go back to florence i mean you know you've got really you got even statements saying stuff like if anyone uh, gets a circumcision as a christian he's affirming the old testament rights and is excommunicated right. or, or something to that effect but right um right. anyway that's so, a discipline that's a discipline, so it can change. But yeah, there's so much of it. There's so much. Of it. The church is rife with it. All of the original eight doctors, four east and four west. I mean, Chris, you've read Chrysostom, Jerome, Augustine, Ambrose. I mean, these guys sound like um, a little bit like Mr. Fuego. And to just take such a strong um, differing position, a diametrically opposed position as the post-conciliar church really picked up the Nostra Tete ball and ran with it. And then JP2 is everywhere calling them elder brothers in the faith. You, to go from perfidious to elder brothers in the faith, that's, that's, that's not a, no. I'm not a sophist. So I, I just, I, I'm like, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to write this book. I, I don't know what else to do, but I, yeah, Trent to, to put the cap on the thing. Trent seems to be, you know, he's with an outfit, Catholic answers, and they seem deeply committed to that program. And um, it is mysterious. I, I do like how the 1993 catechism 
does even with the about face they admit look the relationship between god and the jews must be called mysterious because there's no you know i come not to i come to uh uh not to abolish but to what what's what's fulfill fulfill that that that's a mysterious kind of claim when you, you deal with binaries and um the way i i like to as a philosopher so the you know it's a mysterious thing and um it, but I, I do think philosophically trouble troublesome and um at times wandering into philosophical near incoherence. on your point that the this that the statement of uh florence that to to return to or to get a circumcision would entail a return to the old law you said that was a discipline are you saying that as a discipline because uh conceivably there could be situations where people did this and wouldn't necessarily be excommunicated because the way that it's phrased in this, the area that that's discussed in Cantate Domino, I don't recall that being a purely disciplinary matter because the point is not that you're excommunicated because you happen to get this or happen to have this happen to you, but rather that if you chose to do this, you would be signifying by the action that you're returning to the sacraments of the Old Testament, as it's called, and that would be a, a Hebrews 6 right, rejection of the Christian faith. So. Uh, I'm just curious why you said, I'm not, again, it's not a trap, I'm not trying to call you out, just, is that why you said discipline, because of the fact that, well, there might be situations where you're not necessarily excommunicated because you got circumcised? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the practice of the faith, the disciplines, things you do ritualistically, sacramentals and, and the like, um, are are always undergirded by a, some sort of teaching, by some sort of rationale, by one of the successors of Peter. And therefore, it, it's really a tricky issue to say, where does doctrine end and discipline begin? But right. all I was suggesting without having seen it, I, I believe you on what the, the document says. It's probably more anti-Finkelstein than the way we've sounded for 60 years in my church. It would be to say, well, a disciplinary change can, all, like, like Francis on the Latin mass, to go from this is essentially understood to be the, the the real liturgy of the roman rite and there's this new one that everyone kind of knows is fugazi and not fake but you know cubic zirconia and, and to, to what francis is saying now like he, i'm basically going to get rid of it i have defended francis in that one way because it's it's disciplinary so like a, a pope can enforce his favoritism of a tackier liturgy and things like that um th that doesn't mean that there's not doctrine being entailed by it and presupposed by it and undergirding it. It's it's another area that's that's difficult. I would just say it's mostly involved by the practice of the faith. Gotcha. Um, yeah, by, people in the chat, if you can, uh, I forget the exact, I think it's the decree against the Jacobites from Florence. I don't know, but you guys can look that up later if you want. All right, um, we'll go to the super chats. Now remember guys, uh, uh, I've got Tim's video here. Here's his video specifically on the topic of Christ the King there. You can find his channel linked in the show description, Re Rules for Retrogrades. Rules for Retrogrades. I can talk a little feminism. If yeah, you, oh yeah, I meant, to, I meant to talk. Yeah, we, we did want to talk about some of that. Uh, let me read a couple Super Chats, then we'll go to the feminist topic here. Uh, let's see. Back in my right mind, 88 for 10 bucks. Jay, thank you. I'm reading John Damascus and Vladimir Lossky. A challenge for being a grandmother, but it's worthwhile. Glad to hear that. I did lecture all the way through uh, on the Orthodox faith by John Damascus. If you want to go down to my uh, lectures, if you want to check that out, it might help you with difficult areas. Net infection, ten dollars. <laughs> Thank you for helping me to understand Orthodoxy. I'll be baptized in the church tomorrow. I want to ask about your philosophy one on one course. Would you say that by taking it, I would be just as good as you at debating? Uh, sorry, I can't make that promise. Um, no. So just taking a philosophy course might give you an introduction to debating. It would definitely help you, but no, it won't make you necessarily a good debater. I think that comes with a lot of debating and practice over the years. I've been debating since I was a freshman in, in college. So, uh, but thank you for that. And you said Christ is King. Livio Floria, $10, all the best. Thank you, Livio Flora. Uh, Livio Flora, $5. You can call it anti -sham, sham Wow. Well, hey, look, we're on, uh, we're on a platform that is not known for um, being loose with what you can say. <laughs> so uh, now Tim wanted to discuss some of the issues of feminism. I forgot we did want to talk about that too. And it relates to this issue. Uh, we couldn't have the push for deaconesses and we couldn't have the push for female priests and bishops 
or even Skittles, as Rachel correctly points out, without worldwide acceptance of this ridiculous position of feminism. Yeah, it's like in the middle of 70s, 70 percent of women or something like that in America and England identified as feminists. Now it's the, the numbers half of that or less. But ironically, paradoxically, or perhaps just phenomenally, the the amount of feminist presuppositions that's been imbibed by the average women is is like five times more. And this you, you see this with revolutionary movements all the time. When it's young, then you know a, a higher percentage of people might identify themselves with with being feminists. As the the movement enters the host organism and starts to break down its systems, which is what all revolutionary movements do, feminism more than any of them, um, it does. And, and some of the the you know malefactor effects start being evident people start dissociating from from it. So fewer women say, hey, I'm a feminist. And yet it's having all kinds of effects that even the people that have become conscious of the the badness of the, the, the parasite and have dissociated themselves from it have not yet seen. They haven't seen all the manifold of ways that feminism affects their life. And this is why, it's, it, you know, it's, it's the original gender dysphoria. It's, it makes women essentially hate being feminine and think that it's undignified to be feminine. And even conservatives, and this is really where the, the red peril movement gained its foothold, is that even conservative women who are like, I hate feminists, they're screechy, you know, they hate men, I don't want to hate men. But most of these conservative women are essentially training to be men without knowing it. And um, so, so this is why the effects are much more pervasive than they were, even though the, the label feminism has become less potent. And, and that, that makes for a real um, phantom menace to go George Lucas on you. Are you an angel? <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I, we always crack up at all the goofy lines that Anakin has in that, if you remember. Yeah, young right. Anakin. Oh, Eddie! Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you remember Sebulba. <laughs> Uh, somebody was trying to say that Sebulba was anti-Shamwell, and I'm like, dude, he's obviously an Italian. Like, he's got like the you know, the Padre hat, and he's he sounds like a like a fat Italian. He's not he's not supposed to be Shamwellish. Um, John says for five dollars, yeah, he lives in the desert. Lives <laughs> in the desert. He's always he's always trying to stiff everyone on deals for their um you know their their Nubian parts. Don't make too much of that. That's the name of the ship. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, now you were on, here's the thing you were on with Temple and Rolo in this exchange, uh, two and, a, uh, two 15 minute, two hour, 15 minute exchange over <clears throat> the death of Westerman and his revival. Uh, wh what's your, uh, recap of that? Tell us about, uh, I'm going to link this for the people in the chat. They want to watch this exchange. You guys had, how did it go? How do you feel with, uh, your points? You feel like they, that you got through to, to them or how did it go? Well, from a couple of days before, Rolo, Rolo thought I was an orthobro, by the way. I, you know, I've got Roman Catholics should have more masculine energy. We're, we're, we're papists, for heaven's sakes. The ultimate power to father would be papism. But uh, for whatever reason, you, you, Jay, and some of the other orthobros are, are real strong in that masculine energy. And there are not too many channels outside my YouTube channel. Go, go subscribe, by the way, people that bring the masculine energy um, from a Roman Catholic perspective. But um, so Rolo thought he, that I was an ortho guy and he knows our, our mutual friend, Andrew Wilson, Andrew and Rachel Wilson. He knew of that. So that was kind of his only context for like a Catholic guy that was saying, you know, I'd written a book called the case for patriarchy. And immediately I think he looked into some of my content and it was backtracking, you know, practically moonwalking out of wanting to do a debate. He's like, well, this is more of a discussion. We agree 85%. I'm like, nah, I'd be fine with you, Rolo, or any other red pill man characterizing up to, up to a max of 50% agreement. I'm, you know, I drove out there. I drove, you know, 14 hours each way. I wanted to have oh, a wow. debate. I'm a debater. Yeah, I, I was, I was disappointed to see all the backtracking and saying we agree 85%. No, we agree about maladies 
as we say at law, we do not agree about remedies at all. We are 100% in disagreement about the remedies to feminism. And um, so I, I, if you watch that episode on culture war, I, I was just trying to say, well, let's, let's argue about this. Let's argue about that. I mean, I had a page full of syllogisms and uh, modal arguments to be making showing why we really disagree about the remedies to feminism. Yes, it's really, really bad, but you're, you guys, you red pill guys are saying to do the exact opposite things according to that which you say you fear, the harm you say you fear of feminism. You say you don't like divorce. Well, why are you telling young men to go um, sleep around? You know, whether you, depending on your body count, between four and 10, you jump from uh, multiplying the odds of divorce between 400% and like 600%. And you're, you're telling people to use contraception. This multiplies by two divorce. And you're, you're telling um, young men to do all, all sorts of things that, that militate strictly against the, the conclusion that you say you fear, which is divorce. And I just wanted to get to that. And um, every time I'd say something, uh, pretty much Rolla would agree with me. And Tim, Tim jumped down my throat on a couple things. You know, he, he, he started out. One of the great challenges. Are no good at skateboarding. I was like, yeah. And I brought in the principle and I, we call that hollow out. Or I kind of started hollowing out what he'd said. And then he got a buzz or something and the hands started going up and he started saying no. And he started arguing against his own point. He'd begun. So that was kind of strange. But Rollo and I agreed about every. He's just tripping over himself to agree. I've talked to Zuby about finishing uh, the debate there, or, you know, I'd, I'd be, I'd be pleased to do something on, on your channel. If you were to moderate, I, I want to go do a debate. That's, that's my takeaway principle. Uh, yeah, I'm always down for that. Um, yeah, that, that would be fun. Um, do you feel like you, cause I've, I, I have not gotten through all of this, this yet. I watched about the first 30 minutes. I had to go do something. So, um, I have not finished this whole discussion yet. So, uh, after the fact, do you feel like you, you got through any of your points or do you feel like it was just did landed on deaf ears? Well, I mean, there's a, I clipped a part of it on my Twitter where I was saying, you know, essentially what, what the red pill is advising is just feminism for men, the Skittles cruiser lifestyle for straights. You know, I, I was like, look, premarital contraception, prawn, all this stuff is is um it's skittles, man. It's 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 not what a, I don't care whether you're in in this sense whether you're Catholic or Orthodox or even Protestant. America is a Christian nation, and most of these I know are apostatized young Christian white guys that are listening to basically Jewish and Muslim advice from the red pill. These are all like Jewish Muslim guys, um like horny guys from AP class that, you know, maybe, maybe kind of foreign looking guys that wanted to get with all the young blonde chicks in their AP class in high school and developed a cheat code. It's like, okay, well, these are, I, I understand I'm a realist. Most of these guys are fucking apostatized Christian men, but if they want to defeat the misery, despair, suicide, divorce, poverty, that, that comes from a, a failed marital worldview, you need to return to the faith of your fathers, you know, at, at least Protestantism, if not uh, Catholicism or, or, or Orthodoxy. And that's the solution out. And you guys are just pushing them further and further away with this really Judeo-Muslim view of marriage as a contract. It's not a contract. What do you, that, what do you say to the red pill guys who always counter with, okay, but look, Tim, I mean, the churches are pretty, you know, skittles and and cucked and, and feminized. So, like, why are we supposed to go, uh, you know, back to that institution when it seems to be a basically a feminist institution? That's just their common. I'm just curious. What it's a common saying. refrain. Private, privatized Christian custom. Something as simple as seven minutes a day at pray, at joint prayer. Seven minutes a day. Do you know what the statistics? They've run this analysis twice. One in the early 90s when divorce rates were highest. One around 2012. Do you know what the odds of getting a divorce are if you're a Christian? It's not Catholic specific. And you pray for seven or eight minutes a day with your spouse, R, J? No, I'm not it's familiar. Only one out of 1,152 couples who pray together a day will end up getting a divorce. That means... Because they always say, oh, if you, you know, people are essentially being capitalized, incentivized to 
to enter contracts where they're going to lose, you know, because it's 50-50, man. I'm like, well, yeah, it's 50-50 if you enter in like some secular pig and you're just going to do this contract dance. And um, yeah, men, men are going to lose. I agree. I agree with all the, the problems with the, the lawfare. Who cares, though? If you're a Christian and you're in, even if your interest in returning to the faith of your fathers, to Christianity, is ultimately superficial and you're like, well, I just want to get married and not get a divorce because I because I like women, I want one good wife, then just come back into the church introductorily as a first principle and just pray seven minutes a day. And then all of a sudden your odds aren't one out of two, they're 1151 out of 1152. That's something you can do even in the feminist um, feminist run Christian churches. And they, they, you know, Tim and Rollo just were like trying to push back on that because it explodes the rationale for the existence of the red pill, which I get is uncomfortable, but it's just a fact. Let's see. John says for five dollars, uh, and John, I'm going to reword your uh, question here for the sake of the safety of our listeners on the YouTube audience algorithm sensors. <laughs> uh, and the question is basically, uh, it looks as if rabbinical theology turns God into a kind of relativistic entity and the divine revelation is theologically relativized. In my experience, of, I'm not an expert in rabbinical Judaism. Um, I've read some books on it. Uh, I've had maybe four debates over the years with people who are adherents of rabbinical Judaism. In my experience, the the conclusion of every one of those debates is that ultimately it is theologically relative. So I would agree with that. So basically, the whole rabbinic structure relativizes the meanings of the text, uh, and it basically is kind of whatever the immediate rabbi thinks it is. Uh, that's my experience. Noah M. Three dollars. Jay, will you be going to see Phantom Menace re-release in May? Uh, I didn't know there was a Phantom Menace re-release in May. Uh, I don't. Is is there some big Soy Wars thing coming out, or why would they release 25 years, right? Oh, Wouldn't that be the 25 year anniversary? Years. Okay, it came out the year I graduated high school, like the month I graduated high school. And well, I was so. a trad cat when, when that came out because I remember going to see it. So, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, let's see. Hey, they, can I ask you something, Jay? I'm sure, curious. You can ask whatever you want. Yeah, so what's your this is this is a, a point of legit curiosity. Uh, growing up in Catholic school, you hear why. I mean, literally all the, the liberal ex-nun SJW, who is your, your religion teacher, would say when you're like, why did, why did Jesus hate Pharisees? Would be, oh, because they're hypocrites. And you're like, yeah, but, and I, I didn't know to push back more at the time, but it's like, so it had nothing to do with the Babylonian Talmud, which Jesus did not accept and they had. They did, the Sadducees did not. Uh, what, did you know much about this? It's something I just, just began poking, poking around on. Well, it's relevant uh, in regard to uh, the Muslim apologetic, actually, because if you do a lot of Muslim debates, they'll start appealing to Jeremiah, where Jeremiah says that the Jews had already begun to depart from the law and that they were following these made-up traditions. So when Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees, there's, a, there's amazing parallels with what happens in the book of Jeremiah. A lot of what Jeremiah went through is a uh, direct mirror to Jesus's life and ministry. That's, of course, on purpose for typology, but specifically this passage about what will become, uh, in my understanding, the the, the Talmud. Uh, and Muslims are misunderstanding the Jeremiah reference to think that Jeremiah is saying that the Torah is corrupted, which is ridiculous, but most Muslim apologists try to make this argument that we can prove Bible corrupted because Jeremiah say Bible corrupt. Jeremiah's not talking about the Bible. He's talking about the proto-Babylonian Talmud or what would become the Talmud. So I think, yeah, there already probably is some nascent uh, Talmud coming to, to be. Uh, and that probably that's what Jesus is referring to because it mirrors exactly what Jeremiah says to the Jews of his day. Didn't the Talmud come out of, I mean, came out of the Babylonian exile, which was like 500 years before Jesus, right? Yeah, what I'm saying is that I don't know the exact date of when the compilation of what we call today the Babylonian Talmud is, right. but it does right. go back to this tradition, which presumably 
is what Jeremiah in its in its nascent proto form is critiquing. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's interesting. I'm gonna look into that. Yeah. So if you, uh, I'll pull that up later for you guys in the chat. But it, all of you guys in the chat that have heard the infinite Muslim debates, they always bring this up. Uh, and of course, it has nothing. To, again, it's not. And this makes sense with Isaiah too, because they'll say, "Oh, Isaiah was critiquing." Here's the move they make where they say Isaiah's crit critiquing the Jews of their day, and that must mean the Bible's corrupted. No, no, no. They're critiquing the already existing rabbinical traditions that are replacing the Word of God, and that's what Jesus is doing. Yes, thank you. Exactly. The people in the chat are saying, Jeremiah 8, 8, look, Bible fake. But it also is proves uh, Tim's point, too, I think, which is that Jesus was rebuking the whatever kind of Talmud existed in his day. And there's a Babylonian Talmud. There's also the Palestinian. There's like two different Talmuds uh, in, in, at that time. So there's two different ancient Talmuds, but it doesn't matter because both of them kind of have the same point here. And really rabbinical stuff. Jamie, did you blow up? Are you okay? The Muslims, the Muslims are attacking. I'm just joking. My wife, sounds like my wife blew up. So the Muslims, the Muslims finally did, they did their final apologetic and blew Jamie up. That's a joke. That's a joke. But anyway, uh, Tim, did you want to say anything? I said the Regensburg address. Remember they, they didn't like the Regensburg address because of that. Um, Benedict, Benedict cited, it was on September 12th, cited a uh, Muslim scholar that, that talked to uh, a Byzantine emperor and they, 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 were in the Byzantine emperor said all, all Islam has done that's new is it brought the sword and the Muslims of uh, 2006 tried to disprove him by blowing a bunch of stuff up in the Middle East. Oh, wow. Um, in carbohydrate Lofton since $3. Thank you for doing what you do, boo. Uh, well, thank you for calling me boo. That's really sweet of you. And you do you, boo. Uh, let's see. Um, Tim, anything you want to leave us with? What's what are you going to be doing next? Uh, these are you did a, this pretty big stuff you've been doing lately. What what's what's next? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, we got we got the movie um, that which was originally, originally had highly interested Daily Wire. As, Is this uh, the trailer that you told me to, the the Nick's trailer? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, Nick's trailer. Yeah, the, the the what a woman is. It's an answer to what is a woman. We didn't get much more than the scant, you know, adult human female answer to that much watched Daily Wire film. Uh, what is a woman? So we're working on that. That's what's uh, going to be occupying a bunch of my time this spring uh, with with Nicholas Stumphauser, uh, director of Died Suddenly. And I mean, continue to push. I I think Rollo and I are trying to have an actual debate. I'm trying to have one with him. That was far, far too friendly. And uh, there's just talk about doing this on Zuby's channel. I always, if you look, if you guys want a, um, you know, analysis with a, with a Catholic perspective, I, I, I do something. There's only one and only Jay Dyer, of course, but um, I have, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's a similar spirit or what, but I, I do other stuff besides just Catholic stuff the way Jay does. And there's, there's a lot of natural um, conceptual overlap. Um, so if anyone in your audience would be interested in watching, you know, Catholic. Yeah, I'm sure uh, I would host it. I'm sure Andrew would love to host it. So, yeah, there's always the possibility of hosting anything like that. Uh, so, guys, remember the uh, channel is uh, Rules for Retrogrades. It's linked. Also, Tim has multiple books. Uh, you can head on over to his channel to see the links to get his books. Um, and I want to remind you guys too, that we have a show sponsor, which is chalk.com, the best in supplementation. As you guys know, they have the male vitality stack, which is great for dudes that want to increase their toxic masculinity points. Head on over to chalk.com. Use the promo code J 50 J Y five zero to put in that promo code and get 50% off that male stack. You don't have to pay that full price. My favorite of course is the Tong Cat Ali, which is proven to boost testosterone in peer reviewed studies over at chalk.com, C H O Q.com. Uh, so make use of that and get into the gym, get into being a high level toxic masculinity, meta level a proponent of being toxically masculine. Tim, thank you so much for coming back on. Great conversation. Uh, love the, 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 the deets that you got into and, uh, yeah. Anything you want to leave us with before we head out? No, thanks. Thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, uh ha happy, happy Holy happy. Saturday to everyone out there who's celebrating Easter tomorrow like me and happy, uh, Lent to you guys who are 
a couple of weeks behind in the schedule. Excellent. Cool beans. Everybody have a good night.